First of all, thank you all for coming out, especially first thing in the morning on the last day of a conference. It's always great to see uh, people out here. So thank you. Thank you for coming and joining us for the second Stowe panel. So uh, just to recap a little bit about what we've discussed from our context over the last two days here. So first of all, you heard about uh, our office vision toward mosaic warfare and how we want to be able to create these system architectures, but do it at as fast a speed as we can and make sure it's continuous speed. We're constantly being able to adapt. Then yesterday we heard about uh, how that applies to using time as a weapon. And then also the first part of our Stowe office panels where we talked about, yes, we still have to be able to do something with these architectures. So yesterday we talked about the, the tools in the toolbox, as I like to call it. Uh, so today we're going to continue the theme of this is like our uh, office industry day light here. We want to continue to be telling you, the audience, uh, what we're interested in, what you can expect coming in the future. Uh, and from the perspective now of what really makes mosaic warfare more than just the, the chicklets hanging on the end of lightning bolts. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about the mosaic technology this morning. So to do that, we're going to walk through our, uh, our esteemed panel here. So thank you for joining me up here, guys. Uh, and walked out a little bit of the piece of how we envision building one of these mosaic architectures, or really, it's more appropriately, building the framework of mosaic to be able to create new architectures is really a better way to think about it. So, so first, we're going to have John Waterston, who, uh, pa Pasqua, sorry, it's early still. Yeah, you, you have the same haircut, too. We do. Uh, we're very easily confused. Uh, <laughs> you want to come back up here, John? Yeah. Um, who's going to be talking about, and, and also, by the way, John is on loan to us from uh, DSO, but he, he provides us great support here in STO. And, and John's going to be talking about what we, we think of as the composition problem, which I won't steal a sun, thunder, but simply put, I think of how do we decide what it is we want to throw in the rucksack when we have lots of different, when we're starting from a blank sheet of paper. Next, we're going to have Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jimmy Reverend Jones, who's going to be looking at the problem of how do we actually get the machines to talk to each other? You know, we, we heard yesterday about how we have to have comms, but that's not good enough. That's just being able to pass data. How do the machines on either end actually understand what that data means, which gets into this interoperability problem. So Reb is going to tell us about what our thoughts are on, on interoperability. And then once you start putting these things together, you actually have to have a way to operate them, which is hard enough when it's different humans having to coordinate, it's a lot harder when it's machines that have to figure out how to coordinate on their own, and it's really hard when you have humans and machines. So Craig Lawrence is our, our C2 expert within the office, and he's going to be talking about how we actually operate these mosaics. And then finally, especially when you do roll in that, that human element, it's, it's, I won't say impossible, but you've got to figure out how we're going to learn to fight like this in the future, how you bring in that human element to it. And you can't do that without experimentation. And when we start talking about mosaics and multi-domain and joint and connected, uh, it just changes the whole landscape of how we're going to go do experimentation. So we've got Jim Galambos, uh, who, who is a uh, sort of an alumni uh, Stowe program manager. He still does work within Stowe. He's part of a new program office we have within DARPA called the Adaptive Capabilities Office, but he's going to be talking to you about uh, our vision within Stowe, but really it goes for all of DARPA on how we're thinking about multi-domain uh, mosaic type experimentation. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to John. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so again, I'm John Pashkowitz. I'm not going to mess with that. So let's see here. So again, uh, composition is really the, the heart of the mosaic concept. So I see a lot of familiar faces. A lot of you are actually part of my program community across A-Teams, Cascade, and Proteus. So forgive me if I'm telling you what you already know. You can help reinforce concepts for those who are not familiar. So let me begin with what I mean by composition. So composition at its simplest is how do I combine people, things, and how we use them, be that plans or tactics, in a way that allows us to maximize the, max the number of options we have available to us to accomplish a goal. Okay, so when you think about that for a moment, you realize that that's pretty hard to do. Normally, we don't think about people and tasks and machines at the same time. If you're a roboticist, you think about machines. If you're a human planner, you tend to think about people and plans. So a lot of what I've been doing in my program portfolio is looking at mathematical machinery to glue it together. 
But that's not really that exotic of a concept. For those who are Marines in the audience, you see there's many familiar faces and friends. Uh, the Marines, I think, are the closest to doing what we, what we mean by this in actual everyday practice. So the Marines have a construct, the Marine Air Ground Task Force. You can, it's, it scales from a very large construct like the Marine Expeditionary Force all the way down to what would be a special purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force. What's useful about this concept is, is that it, it considers the, comp the combination or composition of air elements, ground elements, importantly logistics elements, because we're going to get to that in more depth in a few moments, because it's not just that these kill chains magically show up. They had to get there somehow, and they need to be sustained and, and continue in the fight in some manner as well. And then there's a command element, which really gets into my colleague Craig Lawrence's work. All these things come together in a way that allows that special purpose MAGTAF to accomplish a range of missions. Uh, of course, that's augmented by human ingenuity and the tactical understanding and wisdom of the marine operators in the mix. So this is all good, but when you start adding new technology to this, and you start wanting to make time a weapon in the context of what we're talking about, that starts to get harder because you don't actually know what your tactics are. The things you're working with don't really have necessarily well-defined properties, and you still want to harness that, that innovative adaptation at the point of, of combat that uh, General Perkins spoke about on the first day. If you look at how long that takes today, a fine example would be the Marine Corps just wrestled with what the squad structure of the future should look like. That took about 18 months. Right? And that was, Marines, bless them, are, are very grounded experimentalists. If you want to see if a concept's going to work, you go try it. And you really want to see, is that technology really ready? Let's go see how it does. 18 months isn't really time as a weapon. Right? When, if we're talking about trying to close these cycles faster than, than an adversary, we would like to do that in days or even hours or minutes. So how do we do that? So let's talk a little bit about composition. I'm going to come over to this graphic so, you can, so I can point at it better. OK, so really a lot of the things in my program are really about how you dynamically compose. So dynamic composition is not, I'm going to compose the special purpose MAGTAF at the start of the mission or at the point of deployment, but I want to do this in mission time dynamically. So that means that the idea of what the task organization of the unit is is going to dynamically evolve and float and flow as the mission progresses. So you may start out with an infantry company. Uh, with three normal platoons, but as the fight progresses, you might augment it or add or float technology to it. And that takes advantage of the superior maneuver and the speed with which things in the electromagnetic spectrum work, as well as the superior maneuver of small unmanned air assets, for example. So what this graphic is showing is, okay, so let's imagine we have some evolution of needs in terms of uh, C2 of ISR, and in this case it's kill, but some effect. And as the mission progresses, we might find that there's something that changes. We would like to be able to draw from the broader uh, inventory of, of things available to us in the MAGTAF, put those together in some unexpected, surprising way, and develop interesting, effective tactics against an equally determined and adaptive adversary. So in this case, you might be moving from the standard C2 element in the MAGTAF to, OK, well, maybe they're now focusing their attention on something else, perhaps this now gets decentralized, this idea of the control of that gets now pushed out to someone in an LIV who might then synchronize again at some point in time. So this really begins to open up a lot of challenges, but it also opens up a lot of opportunity. So for example, now you have a lot of diverse ways to orchestrate effects within the battle space by drawing on logistics, ground, air, and command elements on the fly in an ad hoc manner which allows you better cost, because you don't have to have the one hardened system that does each of those roles all the time really robustly. And it allows you graceful degradation, because if you lose the ability to control that subset, you have some way to fall back to something else. So this opens up a lot of opportunity, but it also opens up a lot of problems, right? Which are many, and I could spend an hour talking about all these at length. Some of you have read some of the white papers I sent to you. If you're in my performer base, I've inflicted lots of thoughts on this on you. But I want to focus on one today. My colleagues and I have all talked about, and we'll touch on some of these later. But the one I want to talk about is sustainment. Right? So if you think about what the weakest link in mosaic warfare is, how did all that stuff get there? As Tim pointed out, you know, that, that amazing mosaic of, of things that see and shoot and, and manage effort and make sure we don't shoot each other, how did all those get there? How do we know that they even have enough gas? What happens when their magazines run low? Uh, most people on the kinetic end of the business don't like to show pictures of logistics stuff. It's boring, right? I had seven ton trucks on the first slide. So when you actually go and talk to logisticians, logisticians are great, right? They, they are basically you know, 
they make things happen without you even noticing they're there. Um, and it, it's a very human-driven, uh, very laborious enterprise that lacks a lot of the, the glamour and, and you know, showmanship of the, the more flashy stuff. But if you look at it, it really is built around the idea of efficiency. In the time as a weapon panel yesterday, what we saw was you know, Amazon thinks about this idea of, okay, efficiency basically cuts down your ability to take risk. And really what I think we want to get to in a mosaic logistics mindset is the idea of how do we take on risk? How do we take on the ability to sustain this very distributed fluid force? It's not gonna be like this, right? I mean, this is, this is how we do this switch. This is how we, we do this today. We have a lot of planning. If you look at any logistician's playbook, you have your day you're gonna do operations, and you march that back 90 days. 90 days is not time as a weapon either. Right? That's, I need lots and lots of time to kind of get everything in place to make sure that bad things don't happen. That's not fluid, it's not responsive. So, and there's a reason for that, is we've generally had the luxury of control of the air. We get to choose the time and place of our fight. We're fighting a fight on the terms that we like. Of course, that allows us to take advantage of old ideas like centralized control, hub and spoke, which is terrific for unit economic cost in terms of delivery, but it's pretty brittle and vulnerable, and the entire logistics community realizes this today. So for tomorrow, you know, what, what does a mosaic log system look like? Well, it takes a lot of these ideas that my colleagues and I are gonna be talking about in terms of the context of decentralized command, decentralized control, or human command, machine control. Uh, it then applies those to an enterprise that is actually none of those things. I think we really want to get to new motifs, things that aren't necessarily the way that we've normally thought about the way we do things, right? It's, it's not hub and spoke built around cost efficiency. This is now something that's much more fluid, much less like anything you've seen in the world of normal distribution and logistics, with an emphasis on survivability. None of these concepts will work if these guys culminate on day three of the flight. So how do you, how do you take a very small number of things that are available to you and try to sustain a very large number of things dispersed over a large space? Very hard question. Okay, so what I'm interested in next, I'm working on a, a new concept within STO. Uh, this is really around what I'd call a mosaic logistics C2 concept, right? And this is really focused on sustainment, not the large muscle motions to get us into theater. Okay, a really core component of this is situational awareness. So uh, in the spirit of DARPA wanting to take an approach on problems that is not the way that we normally think about it, you know, within the logistics enterprise, everybody wants to look like Amazon or Walmart. We have a very big centralized enterprise data system that gives you awareness into everything. That's not going to happen in the DOD. Like the logistics enterprise process four major commands, right? It goes all the way from DLA to a service, from strategic to the tactical edge. How do you think about what is almost like, it's almost like an intelligence community problem. How do we crawl and scour hundreds of different software systems to create some model picture of what's going on, and then use that to create ideas about how we can think about flexibly and dynamically sustaining a really uh, fluid, uncertain force where you're not really quite sure what's going on at any point in time because it's, it's very unpredictable, that's the point, right? So you have to think beyond the tip fit, which is, if you're a logistician, this is basically how we think through our plan. This takes operational requirements, turns them into basically an order form, and then turns it into things that get shipped on a C-17 or a ship. That's great, we're not gonna throw that away, but we have to find something that works in concert with that to allow us to get what we need logistically. And then really the key insights there are things that come from programs say like World Modelers or uh, CauseX and I2O. These are ways of scouring information to create a model of some underlying truth and then combining that with ideas from say the mosaic programs that I've been part of with my colleagues where we were able to put things together in dynamic and interesting ways to allow you to solve the problem better. So that gets into things like dynamics, network topology, you know, what are your optimization criteria? Okay, it's not cost efficiency, it's probably something like regret or uh, uncertainty. We probably need a reason on, in terms of statistical or probabilistic criteria. So I'm really calling for a, a sea change, a real mental shift in how we think about the logistics enterprise and I'm really excited to potentially work with some of you going forward. So please see me if you're interested in this problem. With that I'll pass on to Lieutenant Colonel Jones to talk about integration. 
Interoperability, or simply integration, is the span of time that it takes to, to go from a product that you develop inside of a program, inside the DOD, to the time that I get it inside my cockpit and can command it uh, via my fingertips. Or some other person inside the battle space gets to, gets to command that piece of technology or capability that you brought. And inevitably, that span of time is measured in years. Uh, no matter how much we try, it's always measured in years. Matter of fact, the more complex a system or a system a system is, that interaction or the capability you want, the longer span that it takes to create that capability. Uh, as a matter of fact, it takes a Rosetta Stone just between two people talking about integration just to make sure that they're actually talking about the same thing. Uh, so at DARPA, we've spent a lot of resources uh, to apply technology to quicken that, uh, that integration time. Uh, so I'm going to talk you through some of the ones that we've solved uh, and a lot of places that we have yet uh, to solve uh, and, and we're, frankly what we're looking for you uh, and your innovative ideas and ways of thinking. Uh, but first I'm going to walk you through some of the ways that we have solved to try to give you an idea about uh, the type of mindset or the type of new things that we're looking for. Now if you want to look at just the uh, uh, just the, the, the problem set of integration. Uh, one way to look at that is just at the pure scope of what we actually include here in the DOD in terms of programs every year. And you can boil it down to two types of programs. You have large or major programs, acquisition category one programs, and everything else. And what it looks like is 40% of the entire DOD budget per year is spent on those major programs. They get a lot of emphasis, but it turns out that only 5% of those are actually ACAT-1 or these, uh, these major programs. 95% or nearly 2,300 every year are the smaller programs. And certainly not every one of them produces some sort of electronic widget or gizmo that, uh, that interfaces with something, but a large majority of those things actually do. And uh, certainly with inside your company, uh, you would really like uh, for those to interoperate between themselves, but oftentimes we don't have the time and resources to actually go do that. Um, now the majority of these, uh, whether it be the, the large major programs, uh, you know, 90 or so that are up there, or even the, the larger numbers, um, those are integrating with 30 years uh, worth of technology just between them. And if you think that, uh, that even our newest space satellites that get designed from scratch that go up um, are immune to this, then you have no further to look at the ground stations that support them that are also decades old. So this problem isn't going away and us as taxpayers, uh, and we are also controlling these programs, we have a very uh, diligent mind set that we don't want to throw out or recreate anything that's already working and already there. Um, so that drives the mindset of that we're always going to have this integration between spans of life, uh, of, of lifespans between uh, the things that we're, uh, we're integrating with. What we really want to do is take all of these, uh, uh, these both major and, uh, and, and non-major programs and be able to make those interoperate between themselves. Uh, but if you've seen even in between your company, just to be able to sheerly talk between uh, the number of people that you want per day, you're not going to get uh, out of many uh, offices other than five or six. We have 2,300 in the DOD. Um, so we call these uh, programs that aren't meant to talk to each other heterogeneous um, systems. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a big major focus of uh, what I've been working on. So now you can uh, bin these in all sort of number of different ways, but certainly uh, one way to look at them is uh, you got major platforms, your ships, your vehicles, uh, your spacecraft, uh, your aircraft. Uh, sensors, we have data processors, which are actually algorithms that, uh, that help us uh, process data into information that we can use. Uh, certainly the, uh, the weapon systems, the data links, and jammers and sensors in between. Now the first major program in the DOD that was really accredited for a system as systems program was, this, uh, was a Navy program called Navy Integrated Fire Control. Uh, and they spent, it's a, it's a wonderful, phenomenally successful program that just went uh, uh, capable, uh, inter initial operational capability a couple years ago. That took a couple of sensors, uh, or sensors from a couple of different aircraft, Pipe those data over existing data links to offboard data fusers to be able to control a long range, uh, a long range missile. And uh, the, the Navy's extremely happy with this capability. Uh, the, the problem is it took over 20 years to do, and it's still accredited as a, as a highly successful program, because it is. But we want to go faster. So what we did is we took a look at the core, uh, 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 core problem set and break these, uh, the problems down to atoms. Uh, and the smallest atom we could really uh, determine was, uh, was really the message. So if you have a uh, core system inside your uh, individual programs or even inside your company uh, that, uh, that all speak the same language, um, uh, basically it's, it's fairly easy to communicate. And if you want to add one more, well now everybody else needs to learn those new languages and the problem scales uh, very quickly. So this quickly becomes inefficient. Um, so in walks a global standard, or any particular standard, that, uh, that allows us to connect things very rapidly. 
But that same connection that allows you to, uh, to connect rapidly through a global, global standard, you can actually decompose into further, uh, further pieces that if you want to add new capability on either side of that, you very quickly see that the same thing allows you rapid uh, integration also is the exact same thing that stands between you and new capability. Because if you ever tried to change a global standard, not only does that take years to do, but it also takes years to adopt after you do that. How many of your systems right now don't adhere to the latest so that when you communicate with my aircraft and I communicate with your subsystem, we don't actually speak the same, uh, same version of that standard? So we wanted to see, we want to test the hypothesis. If sufficient number of programs exist uh, for those 23 or 2400 programs uh, per year, that we could delete that global standard altogether, that we can actually take the differences between how I communicate and you communicate, or my subsystem and your subsystem, and actually achieve uh, interoperability just by those relationships or those differences between them. Now, what we wanted to achieve is global interoperability without global standards, and not only does this work, this works like a champ. Uh, and we've been demonstrating this for the last two years, and this, uh, this simple ring structure actually is, uh, is just one particular path in this entire database uh, of a graph that, uh, from all, all sorts of different uh, commodities. Uh, what we've been able to do is take simple things like uh, a couple of data, uh, a couple of radar sets from uh, two different aircraft, pipe them over existing data links uh, to uh, be able to uh, send to fusers uh, in order to be able to control long-range missiles. And we've been able to do this consistently uh, and basically in, in less than, uh, basically less than a month. And once it's in our database, we can reassemble these things to whatever shows up in the atmosphere in basically less than five minutes. Uh, so I got to say this again because I'm, all, I'm usually called uh, uh, all kinds of different names because nobody believes this actually exists, but it does. Now, we, uh, we do take, uh, take uh, um, uh, hints from uh, other open standards uh, where we separate those uh, as translators, but now we get to actually give uh, engineers back that, uh, uh, that capability uh, to be innovative with, uh, with the actual uh, technology that's inside their system rather than spending it all the entire time on how to figure out how to integrate with other things. Now, what this really looks like is this, our database has grown over time. The reason I throw this up there is because without a tool chain to actually navigate this system, you have to do this and you do do this on your own, which is what takes a couple of years in order to do. Now, what that's allowed us to do, like I said before, is just uh, um, to, to replicate things that, uh, that not only do we want through uh, Navy Integrated Fire Control, um, but we also get to, uh, get to make automated, um, uh, automated gateways that can jump um, uh, jump different waveforms as long as we have a single node in there that's connected, uh, but also connect things that you wouldn't normally associate with, uh, with tactical battle space, and then connecting these things in new capabilities that you would not have the audacity to require. So now that's just one layer of this entire stack of messages that, uh, the, or excuse me, the, the interoperability problem. Certainly what I've talked about here is just the message layer in, uh, in my program called SoSite, that integration tool chain called Stitches. But other places that we've worked on is one layer up from that, the actual networks themselves. So after you have all these data and all this uh, processed uh, data of information, um, how do you get it to where it needs to go? And other programs, for example, Dynamo has been working on that and is currently working on that. Uh, in addition to the actual, the waveforms itself, um, still an uh, still inherent crux is now we have all these software programmable radios and what a program called C2E did was decompose waveforms down to individual building blocks so that you could quickly reassemble those uh, into your software programmable radios that are becoming more and more ubiquitous. But where we want to go and where we really need your help uh, is the bottom piece of this. And we've, we've worked uh, and, and we've had some great success at the top layer, but down uh, as soon as we get to uh, the information layer um, of semantically identifying these, in, uh, these pieces of information or these data that get passed around, how do we know what type of, uh, uh, type of gear that uh, um, we're actually communicating with? And more importantly, um, how do we actually transpose these, uh, these softwares, these functions from one system to another after we've uh, developed for, uh, for $50 million in five years? So one thing that, uh, uh, that we've certainly looked at, uh, and one thing I talked about, is we, well, the software itself we've, uh, we've ignored. Uh, and you might think that your, uh, your software actually looks like a bowl full of spaghetti, uh, but in reality, we've done some exploratory work uh, as, as, you, uh, as you rush towards, uh, um, towards deadlines uh, driven by people like me. That it actually, uh, your software is pretty, uh, 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 pretty structured so that not only can we uh, destructure that or decompose that, but we can reorder it and reassemble it to give new functionality of software that you already have. 
So that's where we're going, and these are some of the things that, uh, that we're certainly looking forward to. And uh, I want to echo some of uh, John, John's comments uh, that the one thing we absolutely critically need through every stay, uh, step of this layer is how do we recompose each one of those things? That is a critical need that, uh, that we are looking for, and we are absolutely looking forward to your innovative ways of thinking. So up next uh, to, to talk about after we have uh, these, uh, these interconnects uh, is how do we actually resource manage all this? Uh, it's uh, Dr. Craig Lawrence. All right, Rev is a tough act to follow. My slides have a lot less movement. You'll see it's pretty static. Um, so my charter over the last few years in Stowe has been to think about the problem of, of given we've got all these piece parts, uh, the, the system of systems or mosaic, how do we select and adapt those parts to, to meet the current mission? So it's battle management, command and control writ large. So you've seen this before, it's our, it's our OB-1, it's awesome. Look at all these pieces, look at all this complexity we're imposing on the adversary. There's, uh, everything's talking to each other, thank you, Rev. And, and we've got new ways of combining the pieces and composing because we've thought through them with technologies like John had talked to you about. Great, but, but think of it also from the perspective of the guy in the cockpit or the guy in the battle management platform uh, who's, who's got their own complex issues to deal with. In a sense, we've imposed complexity, yes, on our adversary, but also on ourselves. And so they're going to need some help to manage these capabilities. They're going to need some decision aids. And it is still humans. It's still humans in the loop there. It's not, we're not Skynet. It's not the automated force. So how do we give them the decision aids, the tools they need to select the pieces to bring to the current fight, so to do the planning offline, and then to manage and adapt those pieces once you get into the fight and as the situation changes. And so we've been chipping away at that problem over the last few years in, in Stowe. We, we started looking at the more tactical problem with our distributed battle management problem, where we're focused really on that battle manager, the E2, E3, down through the tactical fighter, and then autonomy with the man-on-man -man teaming. And in that program, we, we, we looked at decision aids that'll help those operators decide, okay, how do I use this system of system I have? How do I use the pieces, these distributed sensors and capabilities to best go after the fight I currently have, the targets that I have in front of me? And then how do I best understand the situation given I have these uh, potentially degraded data links and even if not degraded, they're, they're already stressed in terms of capacity. So how do I pass the information around to give all these decision makers in this complicated ar architecture the, most, the best information they could possibly get to make their decisions? Uh, so we've made some progress there. It has its limitations, though. It's not f fully solving the, the, the whole problem. For one, it's really looking at a fixed system of system architecture. So we go in, we know we have a manned unmanned team. We know we have, say, uh, unmanned systems that distribute our sensors. Uh, but we're largely sticking with that architecture. We're not doing major adaptations. And we're certainly not reaching across domains. And that's something that we've heard uh, throughout this, this conference that the services are very interested in, we're interested in as well. How do we reach across, get away from just the air domain like we're doing in DBM, and reach out for some, some help from, say, the space domain, the maritime domain, cyber, land, any, any domain. Uh, so there's work to be done there. At the operational level, we also thought about the problem uh, over the last few years in the R space program of how do we pick the pieces that we want to go into the fight with. So that's the planning problem. That's the day before, how do I decide what pieces of this mosaic or, or uh, system of systems do I want to bring together for that, the fight of the day. Uh, and so we really, uh, we, we really started focusing on that problem of more of a resiliency issue. That's the R in R space, resiliency. Uh, we got away from, we don't do any cross-domain issues. We had hoped to look at some of that early on, so there's a gap. There's more to be done there. And we started focusing more on how can we make uh, C2 resilient, so we started looking at distribu distribution there as well. How do we distribute the planning nodes? Right now, it's all done in one air operation center. It's like a single point of failure, kinetic, non-kinetic, lack of comms, and you lose uh, continuity in terms of operational C2. Uh, so that became our focus on that problem, and we got away from some of the challenges that I think still need to be solved to make the mosaic real in terms of uh, operational level C2. So those are, we're not doing cross-domain, uh, and, and everybody would love us to. Uh, that's the first question I get whenever I brief our space is, are you doing multi-domain? Do you do space? Not yet. We're getting there. And um, we're not getting at some of the more complex architectures, too, uh, in terms of even within the air domain, we're not uh, doing a good job of breaking down all the, the, the various stovepipes there and, and dealing with proliferation of unmanned systems and disaggregated systems. So we've tackled a real hard problem, but we've left the door open for more work to be done there. Okay. 
So what's the dream? So if you, were, if you could, could take a step back and say, let's start over, let's uh, clean slate. How would we like to do battle management, command and control for the mosaic? You'd like to think of it as, and let's think of this very tactical example, and, and you may have seen this slide before as well. You'd like to think that any operator in any domain is confronted with a problem, um, a new target that was unexpected, the situation is different than was expected, and they need to adapt to it. They maybe need to form a kill chain or kill web, whatever the term is, build a mosaic. Uh, so what would you like to do? You'd like to discover in real time, in any domain, what capacity is available. I'd like to be able to look out and see what could help me with this problem. I need to do some sensing. I need to you know, find and fix. I need to track then engage. I need weapons. Or maybe there's a non-kinetic way of getting at this problem, whether it's EW or cyber. I want to understand all the menu of options that are available to me. And then I want to be able to understand what, who has capacity, who has, whether it's straight capacity, they have uh, the ability to do it right away, or you might need to negotiate because they're doing something else. Maybe they're, they're doing something else for some other authority. And so there's all kinds of problems with that. I mean, it sounds great. It sounds like, yeah, you want to be able to reach out and get whatever resource you need and solve your problem. But you run into problems of, first off, the discovery issue. You know, how do I reach out and find who has capacity? Especially when I'm crossing domains, and they might not even speak the same language. Sure, we can talk at message level the same language, thanks to the SOCITE type technologies, but they might talk about effects in a different way. There might be a, a non-kinetic way of achieving a broader effect, or there might be a kinetic way of achieving effect. So, so we need to, to reconcile the problems and, and the language of effects. Uh, so discovery, language of effects, then there's the authorities issues. So the space domain may be operating under a completely different set of authorities than the air domain. Or the mar maritime domain, there's a maritime component commander. There's an air component commander. And they've each got their own sets of missions that they're going after. And, and how do we reconcile? How do we trade off? If I need, I'm, uh, say, in that uh, tactical platform in the middle, I've got a problem. Uh, a new uh, target tracking radar has come up, and I need to do it, or I need to take care of it somehow. I need to deal with that problem, or I can't accomplish my other missions. How do those other domains trade off what they're doing already to help me? And so these are some of the challenges we're going to start to look at in the ACT program. Many of you may be aware we have a BAA out right now that, that's looking at these, some of these challenges. And it's looking at, at specifically this very tactical multi-domain problem. But we think some of those technologies would still extend to this operational level, you still, I think of it as the same sort of problem in a different time scale. If you're at an, an op center, you're thinking about uh, space or air problems, and you want to reach out to other resources, it's the same discovery problem, and then negotiating uh, in terms of authorities and, and coming to some agreement and getting a contract for the use of those resources. One's just at a much faster time scale and maybe a, a more limited scope at the tactical, the pointy edge of the sphere. So again, we're going to start to look at some of those problems in, in the ACT program. But that by no means solves all of our problems. I hinted at some on the last slide. Um, and we've learned in doing programs like DBM and R-Space, we've learned as we've gone of, boy, we never thought of that. That's, that's a really hard, hard issue to deal with as well. In particular, uh, we never really thought a lot about the tactics problem. So, so I'm put together this architecture. Um, it, it's awesome. It's distributed. It's, it's got everything that the, the warfighter might want. But, but they're used to their, the same old tactics, uh, maybe uh, tactics that they've learned uh, and, and practiced for many, many years. And now you know, there might be a better way of employing these platforms and give them enough time, the operators, and they'll learn how to do that. And they'll put them together in ways that we hadn't thought of. And we saw that on, on DBM whenever we would do an experiment. We'd set aside a day or two, which isn't really enough, but that's all we could really afford, to let the operators sit, sit down in, in, the, in the cockpits, our, our, our simulated cockpits, and go through and play with the architectures and figure out the tactics that they would like to use. But I think there's a huge opportunity here to, to um, do a little more systematic approach at learning tactics. Maybe there's some learning technologies that might be able to apply to, to figure out, to search through that space of potential tactics, given these new exotic architectures that we've never fought with before, to really wring the most out of it. So given one tactic and, and an architecture, we can optimize that, and that's what we're, we're showing, we're doing on some of the existing programs, but I think we can do more if we do more with tactics. Next is uh, incorporating the human, and this is coupled, these are not orthogonal um, new directions. Uh, is incorporating the human. So how do we train them for these new capabilities? In addition to learning the tactics, you know, it's going to be really complicated. They're used to now rehearsing, say in a more tactical setting, rehearsing the mission, understanding the system you're going in to fight with. Well, what if we, we give them the opportunity to recombine, so to, 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 on the fly, pull from multiple domains? How do you train the operators to do something like that so that they can really take full advantage of these uh, capabilities that we're giving them the uh, opportunity to use now in the mosaic? 
And finally, I think something we, we have not addressed uh, fully on any of the programs that we're currently doing is to look at it from the adversary perspective now. So again, not orthogonal. So if we could learn what the adversary is doing in response to this new architecture we're, we're throwing at them and sort of, uh, through some sort of adversarial reasoning anticipate the way they might respond to the, um, the dilemmas that we're throwing at them, then maybe we could do even better at evolving our tactics. So going really one step further from the, the first bullet and, and discovering and using that to adapt and evolve our tactics. So I think that's really challenging and, and that would really be the, the holy grail in the end. So lots to think about. We'd be, love to hear your ideas uh, for, for battle management command and control. It's a, it's a wide open space. There's plenty more to be done here. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jim Galambos, who, who is really a linchpin for all this, because we can't do any of this without experimentation. Okay. Thanks, Jim. This is the button. That's the big green one. I'm not as cool as the other guys. I'm going to stand behind the podium. But uh, I hope you've seen over the week that this mosaic warfare is pretty exciting. And it really portends a lot of potential for what we might be able to do as we go forward with this war fighting. But in my view, it doesn't take too long to look at kind of these artist conceptions that you've seen and, and a lot of these theoretical ideas and have to ask the question, how the heck do we get from these pictures to actually doing this out in the field? Because it's very complex. And I would argue that the answer is really, it's pretty straightforward and it's not new, it's that we're gonna need to actually build it, test it, learn, and repeat so that we can improve it and keep going. But consider the time and the asset coordination and everything that's gonna go in to try to pull together something like that. We just simply can't afford to do massive exercises and bring these things in and while everybody's waiting around, inject new technology and, and hope these things are working, we, we, you just can't do it that way. Yet at the same time, you could say, well, let's break it up. We'll take that little subset. So that line from the airplane down to the ground, we'll work on that one. And yes, that's a necessary, I would say, engineering test that needs to happen. But if you think by doing all these subsets and then just putting them together, you've got a capability, you're wrong, okay? The whole essence of system of systems and mosaic warfare is that we're operating as a co cohesive whole system. And that means I need to be looking at, just as you heard, battle management, command and control, communications that span across these domains and across these systems to actually achieve these kill chains and create this mosaic kill web that we're trying to do. So we've got a bit of a conundrum. On the one hand, I know I need to do comprehensive detailed testing of all these pieces and I've got to do it affordably and quick because I think I heard the whole idea of mosaic warfare is this concept of time as a weapon, right? So I've got to achieve that, I've got to do it quick. So how do I do comprehensive, detailed testing at the same time encompass the whole so I'm really looking at the essence of mosaic warfare? Well, in my mind, the solution, it's really a combination of a holistic, very comprehensive experimentation environment that is constructive, virtual, and live, coupled with a process that is disciplined and encourages layered, continuous learning and development so that it's not a one time and then we're all done with this. And if you do this, you're gonna blur the distinctions between, hey, these are the S&T guys and they're creating something and now the requirements guys gotta figure out where to use it and the acquisition guys at some point are gonna get stuck with it. Now, we have to blur these distinctions and do this together. Now, before I begin or, or continue, I want to mention I use this term constructive virtual live, and I want to make sure people understand what I mean by that. When I say constructive, think of that as that is your purely simulated forces 
that are inside the computer that you have given behaviors and properties to, and it runs in a scenario. And if you go hands off, you can watch and see, just like a, a video game, hey, what happened? Virtual is when I start to allow portals that allow an operator to now take control or interact with some of those items that are in there. So it may be doing this scenario, but if it's your little video football game, now you get to be the quarterback and decide when the pass goes. And then live, of course, is, hey, I'm actually doing this, but at the same time, this live asset thinks it's immersed in this scenario. At the same time, other these virtual and constructive things are interacting with it. So with that as a bit of a definition, let's go ahead and describe a little bit about what I mean by this environment. And you see this picture. What we're trying to do is we're trying to first represent the entire theater level environment. And what do I mean by that? That means the environments from seafloor to space, but also the red and the blue forces interacting and doing this in a constructive manner, but with the interfaces that you see, so that now up at the top, I can bring in these algorithms and things that uh, you were just hearing about and, and all the AI jazz that you've been listening to all week. That needs to be able to extract information from this scene, run their tricks, and then push that back out in the form of commands and, and recommendations for the things to operate. But then you see on the right side, I want to be able to do that with operators. And so this whole idea is that I start in this constructive manner and then I'm going to progress where if I've done my interfaces right, I can start to replace these constructive items with actual virtual and real components, software, hardware, and people in the loop. Now, there's a few challenges to doing that, okay? The first challenge is we need to simulate all these environments, and I would argue we need to do this at varying degrees of fidelity. Because I can't do high fidelity everywhere, all the time, across something that is a, a theater-wide environment with maybe thousands of elements. And I can't do that because the computation to do that would just bog down even today's systems. So what I want to look at is I want to look at a strategy that says, well, hey, I may have a thousand elements in here, but a lot of them aren't that involved right now. And I certainly don't need to do high fidelity of six DOF model of them turning left and right to capture the information I need. But boy, especially for mosaic warfare, that communications path for the specific kill chain and those elements involved in that, I would really like to do that at high fidelity because I want to see, does that signal really propagate? Is that sensing really going to happen? And I need to see that fail in a, as most realistic way as possible or succeed so that when the rest of the system reacts, it's authentic. So one of the biggest keys there is these varying degrees of uh, fidelity. And that's a, a fun problem when you start to think about all the levels. The next key attribute, though, is I need to credibly represent the behaviors of my assets because I've used that word affordably a few times in this talk. Well, how do we do this affordably? If I have to put a person behind every one of those dots that's making decisions, well, I've, I've failed, right? I now have this army of people. What I need is credible constructive forces such that I only need to bring in a handful of the key decision makers and operators to interact with this system but what they're seeing is credible. Well, now that means I have to really think about defining the behaviors and the interactions of these constructive elements. A fun thing on the road to doing this happens, and that is it forces you to actually start working out what are these command uh, and control relationships 
between these elements. And it forces you to bring engineers together with operators and people who actually build the stuff to go, well, hey, this is what it does. Well, when I'm flying my plane, I do it this way. What falls out of that is you actually start to get a very nicely jointly developed set of requirements for, oh, if we want to integrate this unmanned thing or have these machines work with us in this way, I've already, because I had to get my stupid simulation to work, defined those relationships which can then turn around and actually represent what goes on in the real world. But it's not just the environment. I mentioned this whole idea of process. We need to think about a very disciplined process that is systematic and comprehensive in looking at these different dimensions of the problem and then constructing experiments that pull in the right operators and, and folks to work our way through, as I said, from when this is purely constructive to now I bring in real hardware in the loop to real uh, systems in the loop, such that as I do that, what emerge, I mature the technology, but what emerges is this mosaic warfighting capability. And if I do it right, I've already been walking through the valley of death of transition and I didn't even know it because we've been actually living it together. And I'm not now throwing it over the fence and the guys are going, God, I've got all this software and these things that talk to each other. What were we trying to do? What was the mission? How does this go together? And then, heaven forbid, they build it and the, train, the operators go and I don't even know where this fits in my organization to use this. I've got this capability. No, they've all been working together doing this testing continuously such that hopefully if we've done it right, we're spitting out capabilities and we do it in kind of a DevOps way which says, hey, you know what? This baseline kind of works. We've got more to do. That's gonna be the next wave of experiments, but we can start using that and we roll it in, and as I said, I've emerged, I've got a live virtual constructive environment, I can include that training right in with the development. And we all know, uh, you know, there's this huge divide of, if the operators knew what we could build, they'd tell them to build it, and if the guys who are building stuff knew what the operators wanted, they'd make it. It's a paraphrase of Winston Churchill quote. This is blurring that to pull that together into this continuous environment. Okay, so what's next? I will tell you that at DARPA, we have started this idea and have, uh, are actually trying to live it with uh, some of our programs. Maybe you've heard of CDMAS as our maritime system of systems program. Uh, we're expanding that with uh, some other capabilities through our salt breaker efforts. But we are just at the beginning, and there are tons of technical challenges just within that modeling and simulation. I mentioned this idea of variable uh, fidelity, and think of overlaying cyber and EW on top of sensing. There is plenty of uh, room for clever ideas on how we do that better. Um, and then just this whole idea of thinking about, hey, how do we create this so that we get into this DevOps mode of here's a baseline, we're working together and we're thinking about this from a, a mission capability and we just keep this continuous squirting out of the technology. And so there's lots of opportunity on both the process as well as technology for the environment. And uh, I'm kind of hopeful that uh, we're having some impact within the department. Uh, I think a lot of people are nodding their heads that this is kind of the way to go. I will also tell you that they're kind of scared to death of how to get there. And uh, this is kind of our way to start suggesting, hey, let's get together and build this environment and use it and, uh, and do this experimentation to get to that vision of mosaic warfare. So with that, I think we're gonna have some questions. So I'll turn it back over to Tim.
All right. <clears throat> thank you, Jim, and for, uh, thank you for the panel. All right, so we've got a whole bunch of really good questions that have come in in a relatively short time. So I'm going to try to combine a few of these and, and paraphrase here. So uh, a number of the questions have involved in some way or another the, the human and the training aspect. And there's uh, someone actually uh, provided a common quote uh, that the military worries about train like you fight, fight like you train. We're talking about new combinatorics, unbelievable complexity, new force packages dropping into the battle space that they didn't even know this configuration existed before they go to the go to the fight. First of all, how do you how do you roll the human into that? How do you handle the training aspect? How do you build trust? And, and then I'll, I'll twist in another question here. It's not necessarily just the human getting that personal confidence, but actually even understanding that this new architecture we put together might actually work when normally, historically, in the DOD, we might spend years going and doing developmental testing. So c can the panel, from your perspective, comment on human training and trust? Mm -hmm. You want to start off on that one, Greg? Yeah, sure. So um, we do a little bit of it uh, you know, before we go into events on uh, programs like DBM and, and our space to some extent. Uh, and well, it's, it's just for us, and I don't, I don't think we've got it cracked. That's why I say we need a new program in this area. It's more um, get them in front of the tools, get them practicing with them, and show them it delivers outcomes that, that they believe in and that they, um, choices maybe that they would have made, and sometimes when it surprises them with some of the choices that it makes, that they see that it's effective and they see why it's effective. So it's sitting at our tools, using it in front of a, a simulation. So we, we, we need the simulation capability to practice it and, and try different tactics. And I think as we move towards uh, mosaic and more complex architectures, they're going to have to you're not going to be able to train and practice with every system you might fight with. So how do we solve that problem? That, that's even harder. But maybe if there's there's just there are some certain characteristics to the architectures they will be fighting with man done man team so distributing capabilities so if we start with just practicing with representative architectures that look like that then maybe it's uh, less difficult to start inserting specific capabilities but I don't see how you get around it other than just having them actually use the systems uh, practice with them and gain trust in in the outcomes that they produce there's, sorry there's no secret sauce or magic in that answer mm -hmm. well I think that ties to that whole idea that I was getting at of if it's a continuous experimentation environment that they're in it all the time and we get away from this idea of hey I'm gonna get this thing and get my qual card and once I've done that you know I know everything as opposed to no today we're doing this problem and here's the environment and and these are the tools that are in it and some of the people on the side are engineers who are trying to observe how they use it and some of them are guys learning to use it and then you feed back to go hey this is this is what was good this is what was bad this is what we got to do next and it's this continuous environment as opposed to sequential and segregated is really I believe the key so, so if I could put it in a different term it sounds like you know our theme of speed helps mitigate some of the risk that we're also creating in the process if I could just add one more thing I forgot to add, I'm so sorry, John, before cutting you off, is one of the things we've emphasized on, on our space to gain trust of the operators is, is um, we call it transparency and directability. So they need to be able to, if they want to, they can go in and build the whole plan. Uh, we don't want them to. We want them to start understanding the, the plans and, and start using the automation. But we, we give them the ability to go in and build it and alter it. Uh, as far as transparency goes, we also give them the tools to dig down and see every little piece, every little insight of those plans. So I think that's an important part of it, giving them as much control as they want and the tools to understand the plan, at least when it comes to, to planning and, and battle management. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. No, no problem. So I mean, in Proteus in particular, we, we use two terms a lot. One is cognitive fidelity. The other is option awareness. So cognitive fidelity, to touch on both Jim and Craig's, is Okay, so unless you want to do everything experimentally, which isn't really scalable, you have to do something virtual in some sort of virtual or constructive. The cognitive fidelity is, is presenting the right kinds of, of stimuli or situational awareness cues to that operator, such that 
they see things that are important in their decision loop, and then when they make actions or choices, that what's manifested in that environment actually reflects also what is important. So, you know, I don't care about the color of the gravel most of the time because it doesn't matter. So I don't need to spend time and effort putting that into a virtual setting because it's irrelevant, right? The, the second is, is this idea of option awareness, which is um, maybe the best analogy is, is that what we'd like to do probably is to get away from, we, we, most of our training enterprise is fingers and thumbs, right? It's, it's the mechanics of learning how to do something. So you know, you're learning to drive a complex system in part because there's not sufficient automation in it. And part of the time as a weapon is, is that the automation is going to be there. So that's, you don't have to spend time doing that. So the analogy we sometimes make is, is like if you're a musician, you know, a lot of your early training as a musician is the mechanics of playing the instrument. Once you reach a certain level of mastery, you understand the music theory enough that you can almost pick up, you know, subject to some motor control constraints, you know, a string musician can pick up almost any other kind of string instrument and play it with some reasonable competence. And actually what you're thinking through at that point is your options to create the kind of thing that you want to do with that tool. That's really where we're going. So you know, instead of shifting from a sort of recognition prime decision making where I've been trained mechanically in this sort of stimulus response. That's the realm of AI. That, the human adds no value in that going forward. What you want is the, it's, it's like the jazz musician understand, okay, I can improvise on this, on this key and this melody in an interesting way. I don't actually really care about the, you know, how I fret the instrument, that's irrelevant. So yeah, I think that's the other thing we're going to. That must be the AI jazz. Someone the AI jazz, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, so, um, another set of questions. There are several questions here that are, isn't this the same as? And it's a whole range of things no. from combined arms warfare to service-oriented architecture to, you know, tr you know, traditional system engineering to more exotic. Is this just hacking yourself? So easy no. Um, you point blank, dead answer no. Um, and why that is, is because each one of those groups, and, and specifically uh, uh, building on what you guys just talked about, is that each, each one of us, as we go into our own, own little local domain, like, hey, after we get this from the engineer, or the engineer says, after we give this to the operator, or the program manager says, after we give this to the performer, uh, every one of those steps always assumes that I'm going to give this over the fence and that somebody else is going to carry this, the step that it needs to go. Uh, but what, what doesn't happen in, in, in this to achieve uh, Mosaic, and which, which I think, frankly, Mosaic is going, is, is how do we holistically attack from start uh, to inside the, uh, the battle space, that holistic solution, so that when you actually get in at least three actionable things, uh, at DARPA, at program managers, and contractor level, that if you actually want to achieve this, uh, we have to start with what's the function uh, or what's the form that we want to drive the function around, rather than here's a function, um, does, it have a, does it have a problem associated? with it. Um, uh, that, that's the thing that will achieve mosaic that all these other, uh, other um, combined battle arms, uh, agile uh, acquisition um, always assumes that you have somebody else to take a baton and run the rest of the distance with it um, rather than you also bringing them into your group. I would just add that so a lot of it's terminology and yeah some of those things do have similar characteristics to problems that have been looked at before. Combined arms is very much like multi-domain. Did we solve all those problems? I think there's still some open uh, issues to be solved there, what, whatever you call it, mosaic, multi-domain. Uh, there's, there's plenty of work to be done. And we ought to leverage what was done in the past in those areas too, which I think we are. So. Okay, this next set of questions I'll, I'll try to combine could probably be the topic of a whole conference by itself. The dreaded acquisition transition. <laughs> so uh, in particular, a lot of what you're all talking about get much more specific to operational details, in particular mission details, than most of the things we talk about from a DARPA technology standpoint. At the other extreme, a lot of what you're talking about from a technology capability can get fairly abstract and amorphous and certainly doesn't fit into nice program office, program of record blocks. How do we think about transitioning this type of thing? It's... <laughs> It's hard because uh, you know I'll be the first to tell you I, I've been working this with the the CD Mass program and it's the number one question people ask. Um, and I would say at the first level we're part of trying to push a little bit of a revolution in thinking about the approach, which is instead of buying ships, aircraft, and and, and submarines, and then 
figuring out how to do missions with that, we're trying to say your mission is wide area anti-submarine warfare. Here's how you do that. Now, by these things, because it fits into that mission area. Um, there have been some efforts. Certainly, uh, you know, the Navy has stood up their N9I and, and, and some of these places to take some steps towards this. But it's a case where we really need to work kind of at the three star and above to recognize, hey, you're, you're at a level where you care about the overall mission. Um, and, and, you know, and the Navy did this with domains. The submarine guy is now actually the undersea domain uh, warrior. I think these are steps in the right direction. Um, but I, I'll be the first to tell you, there is work to do to convince them of the value. And that's really the proposition which says, I'm giving you more capability for a lot less money. Uh, I think the arguments are there, but they're yet to be consummated. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. And, and I know it comes back to a, um, a buzz phrase we've been using for years, but I really believe in this co-evolution of con-ops and technology. Um, if, if we're doing a system, a battle management system, that, that doesn't even come close in any way to, to providing a useful capability now, it's almost hopeless to, to transition it. If, so the strategy has been, well, let's, let's have a vision, that you know, this awesome mosaic vision uh, 10, 20 years out. But let's also have a capability that might provide some value uh, under today's requirements in today's Air Operations Center on today's uh, AWACS and Hawkeye platforms. And then, you know, if, if, they, if they start playing with it and see that there's more to it, maybe they evolve the con ops and, and start using some more of the capability or at least have that vision still planted in their head. And, and, and you hope that works, but you're not gonna get into a program of record now if you're not consistent with the capabilities that they need now and the requirements they have now. And by the way, one other thing we can't miss in all of this is just like in an alley, if you're walking alone all unafraid because you feel like you can take care of yourself, you're less likely to need teamwork. But if you look across the street and there's a gang of bullies over there, it's amazing how much quicker you want to find your buddies and put your arm around them and say, we need to work together. <laughs> and I would argue that we've had kind of 20 years of there wasn't a big bully across the street. And so we had the luxury of you know, maybe run in our separate ways. I would tell you that there's now a bully across the street that is getting people's attention. So, Actually, there's two, two of them. Yeah. And, and I would argue that <clears throat> there's a, there is a strong uh, command signal from other parts of, of the military and the government to do this. Uh, if you're not aware, Congress has given uh, what's re referred to as 804 authority, which is the ability to do uh, experimentation within DOD on how acquisition is done. And one of the things we're looking at here with the Mosaic portfolio is the idea of doing uh, as, as much experimenting, as much as we experiment at DARPA with new technology, taking some of our technology and using them as pilot experiments to help the services figure out how to use this 804 authority. So I think there will be a lot of opportunities there. Well, one thing I'd like to add about what, what could help transition, and this is, this is certainly just from, from the proposer side. I mean, certainly I, I do a lot of work on the, uh, on the military side, but uh, what, uh, what would it be extremely helpful uh, uh, is to actually bring, a, bring something from your company, some, some fielded product, along with that proposal to say that, hey, if this thing works, this team is really on board all the way through to help integrate that with. And that way, if it's successful, you already have that inherent thing inside your company, then the only thing I gotta do is say, hey, look at these guys, look at these folks, they did it well and here's how they did it. Uh, but we don't, we don't often see that. Lots of other good questions, we're running out of time. So I, I wanna I apologize for those of you I didn't get to. There are a bunch of good uh, industrial-based questions here that would love to take uh, offline with folks, and they, we may be following up on those issues in the future uh, on the economics of this. But, but Jim said something important with, you know, when you got the bully across the alley teaming up, and I, I do see a few folks here uh, that represent our coalition partners. Just very briefly, your thoughts on how Mosaic Warfare applies to fighting with allies and partners? I, I think it's key, and it actually helps us perhaps get into a better position to work with them. And the reason I say that is, if I'm in a regime where I can do kind of this publish, subscribe, hey, we found 
a, a target and we've identified them and here's a timestamp and this is where they are. And I do that so that the Marines or a Air Force fighter pilot or a Navy submarine can ingest that targeting and do something with it. It makes it an easier step to say, well, how about I make that a coalition partner because this is a transient piece of data that is really relevant right now, but I'm not giving away all the secrets of how did I get that, but I've created this mosaic where I already don't care. I just want to know what showed up on my screen of bogeys and do I have the ability to address any of these issues, and we go from there. So I think it really works its way towards that. In an AOC, there is no fight without a coalition. So, I mean, it, it's assumed that that's part of the mosaic. Okay, so before we thank the panel and get off the stage, I want to do one last thing. And uh, I mentioned yesterday, you know, the real work that's done and the real f people that all of you in industry want to talk to are the program managers. So in addition to these four gentlemen on stage, can all of the Stowe program managers stand up and, and wave your hands? No. Okay, these are the folks you want to be talking to. We're taking so with that, uh, thank you for all your hard work and thank you for the panel.